So now we're going to look at deep learning, how AI can exhibit the processes similar to human learning. Now this all relates to the neural networks. Just as in the human brain, we have neurons forming networks, so do we model this in artificial intelligence applications, particularly what we frame as neural network applications. So essentially we're trying to explore the way that um, biological brains made up of neurons work by recreating those in a computer simulation, for want of a better word. So as we've discussed, these neural networks have layers. We have the input layer, we have the output layer, but where everything happens is in the hidden intermediary layers between those two inputs and outputs. This is where information can be encoded. Now, the way that this is done is through training the neural networks, as you're doing with your chat systems. And artificial neural networks have various uh, processes and properties that relate to them. Now, the first of this is the neurons themselves. The inputs, the outputs, the hidden layers, and the connections between them, which represent the neurons. Now, these become mathematical models within a computer system. So they're not physical wires and things like that. They are um, mathematical simulations. So each of these neurons has a weighting, a value, which represents um, the importance of the link between one neuron to another neuron. And indeed, each neuron will normally connect to several other neurons. And these weightings can change. And the way we train our neural network is by adjusting those weightings. Now, as you'll see with the um, teachable machine activities, um, that's a relatively simple process. We can show it a series of images and it will then change the weightings based upon the shapes and colors and representations available in those images. So we don't have to know exactly what those values in terms of the weightings need to be. We can train our model on example information and it will determine the weightings. Now, this has positives and negatives. One is it's much easier to train. The other is though, we don't necessarily know exactly how it's working. We know it is working, but we don't necessarily know exactly how it is. We can, but it takes a huge amount of forensic investigation to actually work out what's occurring within a neural network, particularly a large complicated one. Of course, the information is encoded across many hundreds of neurons um, in quite complex ways. So these weightings represent biases. Um, it's a decision made when it, the um, AI needs to make a decision between two parts, just like you had decisions in your initial um, interactive quizzes, and then you had decisions in your computer game, forming a decision branching tree. So does a neural network or an AI system need to make decisions, and it makes them based upon those weightings. But how we've trained that can introduce bias. It will choose one pathway over other pathways. Now that's intentional. We want this system to make decisions based upon um, various inputs, and it will then produce the outputs that we want to have occur. But we don't want unintended bias to be built into that process. And we'll explore that um, a little bit later. So this process of training is called forward propagation, where we introduce examples into the system and it changes those various weightings. Now, as our system is trained, we need to make decisions as to whether or not that training has been effective. And we do this through what's called the loss function. Essentially, if it detects a image as being a cat, and it is a cat, 
then we identify that as a, um, a positive. If we um, show it an image of a dog and it identifies it as a cat, then that's a negative. And we use then a process of backpropagation to go back in and adjust the weightings based upon whether or not it has been successful or not in achieving the outcome we wish to see occur, um, achieving the loss function. So strange terminologies being used, but essentially it's a relatively simple process, which you are going to be exploring in the development of your chat system and through the use of the teachable machine examples. So this all results in an optimization process where through the training, it gets better and better. And through the um, process of identifying whether or not things are correct or not, it then goes back and optimizes through the back propagation process, which allows these models to improve over time. So that's what's happening with most of our um, commercial AI models. They're being used by millions of people and where they're being used successfully, that is then being back propagated in, but also when it's being used unsuccessfully, that's being back propagated in to improve the system. Uh, just as with um, driverless vehicles, um, the training that it receives from the data uh, that it experiences in real world applications is used to improve the system by retraining it, by using back propagation to reinforce the positives and diminish the negatives in terms of probabilities as to which pathway the AI chooses in various decision-making options. So this form of um, AI using neural networks forms part of classification systems where we're trying to make decisions as to whether or not we should do one thing or another thing. Now, Classification systems were used in science to classify butterflies or animals based upon properties. So it would have various properties of an animal. Does it have four legs or two legs? Does it have wings? Uh, does it have fur? Does it have eight legs or six legs? And by um, asking a whole series of questions, we can then get down to specific answers. So there are a range of different types of classification systems used in neural networks. Now, the first of these is the convoluted neural network, which is um, where we have a whole lot of neurons interacting with, across various layers. Um, and well, all the neural networks have that, but um, essentially this is what we use in our image prediction um, neural networks. And it's probably the most common form of neural network. Then we have recurrent neural networks, which are mostly used in real-time language translation, where it needs to be much more uh, responsive and um, conduct uh, translation over time. Then we have a more esoteric one called the sh called the short-term short-term memory um, model or short-term memory networks, or the gated recurrent units. Um, which are used in very specific applications. But the most popular one at the moment are the transformers. And this is what has driven change with the large language models such as ChatGTP and, and so forth. So transformers have changed the way we utilize neural networks. Now, normally with neural networks, it comes to a decision and looks at the weightings and needs to make a decision of whether or not to choose one pathway or another pathway. Or indeed, there could be many different pathways, but it um, those decisions activate other neurons and they go down uh, and go to the next la layer and then activate other neurons and so forth. What the introduction of transformers does is that in making that decision as to what the weightings um, tell the artificial neural network what to do next. It doesn't just look at those weightings. It looks back at the weightings of decisions it's made in the past. And some of these transformers look back 60 or 100 previous decisions. Now in doing that, 
it forms an understanding of the train of thought that is leading to the current decision. Now, it's not really a true understanding. It's still all based upon mathematics and on these weightings. But this process allows it to um, build a train of decision making so that its current decision is based upon previous decisions as well as the current weightings. Now, that process um, called attention allows it then to be much more successful in things such as natural language processing, uh, building up a narrative, creating a story, as we're seeing with our um, uh, large language models. But it's also useful in creating images, because the images are then not just based upon a particular decision as to what colour or shape to introduce, but a whole range of previous decisions so that the image starts being created um, that has some consistency with a whole range of decisions rather than just a specific decision as we would see, say, in your game engine. So that is what has allowed the transformer models to be successful in creating these large language models such as ChatGTP. The concept of the transformer um, being able to introduce the concept of attention which builds out a response that is much more complex than we'd seen previously with neural networks. So these classification processes can be used in a wide range of uses. And I've given you a link to UClassify, which is a collection of um, neural network classification applications. And given one example, such as a sentiment classifier, where you can show it a whole series of text and it's been trained to recognize whether or not that bit of text is positive or negative. Now, fairly simple in terms of um, a classification neural network, but it could have a wide range of applications. I just give the example of being able to work out from a whole lot of, say, social media tweets or news articles whether or not they are positive or negative towards teachers. You could do a simple search and get a thousand news articles that mention teachers, put them through the classifier and get an understanding of whether or not the media represents teachers positively or negatively. So a whole range of applications could be developed just through that simple classification process. And by looking at you classifier, you classify, you'll see a whole range of different ideas that people have come up with around classification systems. And I'd like for you to give some thought as to what type of classification system you could come up with in education that could provide some use and share that under Teams and we'll discuss that further in the tutorial.